Hi everyone and welcome to Thursday Thinking for Bootcamp 2024. Today we're really pleased to have Aaron Chatterley with us, Digital Jersey board member and also founder of Feel Unique and more recently Indu. Welcome Aaron. Thank you. <laughs> um, so let's get started. Obviously we're all here to um, understand more about your journey as a founder but we always like to ask um, a bit more about your background, where you grew up, your education, that kind of thing. So can you tell us about the early years? Potted history. Um, yeah, so I was born in Jersey. My father is from Jersey, my mother's Australian. Um, so I spare, I was here till I was five, went to Grooville School very briefly. And then we moved to Sydney and I grew up in Sydney, went to school in Sydney and moved back here when I was 15. Um, I, I wasn't like a textbook entrepreneur. I wasn't like you guys. Uh, I know some of you have like had businesses or had, you know, um, ideas and, you know, projects you've been working on for a long, long time. I had ambitions to be a musician. So when I was in my late teens, all I wanted to do was play the drums. Um, but I also knew that the chances of success were quite low. So I moved to London, I was playing the drums in London for a couple of years and um, I sort of said to myself, I get to 25 and I'm not gonna be a professional musician and I'm gonna quit and get a proper job. Um, I knew loads of musicians who were 25, 35, 45, 55, brilliant, some of them um, still trying to make it uh, and then some terrible musicians who made it really big and so much of it was about luck and positioning and the right band, the right time, the right people that it was for me it was um it was high risk ca career but what i'd been doing alongside playing the drums was working um part time in telesales selling phone systems and fax machines on my you know kind of like days off here and there and as i got closer to 25 i'd been working almost half time for a big company called cable and wireless which was a big telecoms company and sort of um how old am I now? Like early 90s. <clears throat> and um, I got to 25 and literally didn't pick up drumsticks again for like 20 years. Um, Kevin and Wallace offered me a full-time job in marketing um, and I ended up going for work, working for them for six years. And I spent... Is this, sorry, in the Sydney or in the UK? This is in the UK. I'd, I'd moved back, to, I'd moved, sorry, I moved back to Jersey when I was 15. Okay. And then I left Jersey when I was 19 and moved to London. Mm -hmm. So I was living in London at the time. And got into cable and wireless and I was working in, in marketing and I got, um, I got a secondment to cable and wireless in the West Indies. Cable and wireless operated all the telecoms companies mm -hmm. across British West Indies. And this was in 1995. Uh, and my role there was to facilitate the launch of cable and wireless as internet service provider, which was called Carib Surf from a marketing perspective. So I spent a year out there helping launch this ISP, this platform at a time when dial-up, probably like half of you don't even know what that is now, dial-up was like 14.4K when I got there and by the time I left it was 28.8 and it was, it was a whole different world but that was the beginning kind of of, of the internet's reach into, 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 into people's homes. And um, so I spent a year helping get that get that up and running, and then I moved back to Europe, and worked with Cable and Wireless in Paris and London. As my job title in '97 um, was in, uh, Internet Evangelist, and my role was because Cable and Wireless is a huge company back then. My role was helping Cable and Wireless as bigger corporate companies because they had very little expertise in the internet at that point understand what the internet was, what it could do for them, um, both in terms of the World Wide Web, people were already using email in a big way back then, but helping these companies understand what the opportunity was, um, and then obviously on the basis that the sales teams could then go in and sell them a load of technology and platforms to be so able to So you were like the top it. of funnel. Yeah. Um, and then during that year, um, what I found was a lot of the big companies that I was working with, <clears throat> That they had this real kind of struggle in that they knew that this thing was not going away and they were moving away from print brochures and they were having to get websites built 
And in the UK at the time, there was a there was no web development skills or very, very little. There was a few massive players like Blueberry and AKQA, these massive design agencies. But a lot of a lot of um, a lot of the clients that I was talking to were obviously convinced it was it'd be very difficult not to be convinced by this point that this thing was not going away. But the struggle was finding expertise that could help them build websites. And at the time, there was either a lot of graphic design companies that knew how to make things look beautiful, but had no idea about the tech behind it and or the business application, because they were they were mostly kind of print designers that thought this is a thing we need to get into it. Or they were IT and software companies who knew how to put stuff together, but had no idea about presentation and branding and kind of commercial applications or they were business consultants who had no idea about design and tech. And there were very, very few companies at that point that were able, that I felt comfortable, we as a business felt comfortable pointing our, our customers to and going, right, these are the people that can do what you want. Um, and I just had this random conversation with my father-in-law at the time who owned a big print company in the, mid, in, the, in the Midlands. And I'd never been entrepreneurial at all. I was quite happy, I'd paid a stack of money I was working between Paris and London. I had a, I had a great job in a, in a brilliant company. But I said to my father and I was like, you know what? I think there's like an opportunity here. Um, I think there's a, I think that this, there's a, I'm thinking about kind of maybe quitting my job and finding some people who understand the tech and the design side of this and maybe start a web design company. Thinking he's gonna think you're insane. Um, you married my daughter, you know, you've got a great job and now you're thinking of like quitting everything. And he said, you know what, we've, as a, as a print company, we're based in the Midlands, he said, look, we are really worried about losing a lot of our business to, um, to you know, to the World Wide Web. It's, a, it's starting to happen. This is in 97, 96, end of 96. And um, he said, look, if you want to do this, um, how about we, his company, and you know they were big. They had clients in the Midlands like Jaguar Land Rover, Amtico, Sky Television. You know they were they were a big operator. Um, he said, if you want to do it, um, how about we fund you? You can sit it under our umbrella as a separate company, um, and we'll you know we'll fu we'll fund it and we'll take thirty percent of it. We did this deal very very quickly, and I was like, yeah, why would I not do that? Um, and in return. Um, we'll give you access to all of our consume to all of our clients, um, and that's what we did. And we, I found a, a friend of mine was a designer for BMW, graphic designer. Um, they were starting to do a lot of web work. I spoke to him and said, "Look, I've got this opportunity. Do you want to get involved?" He didn't live that far away, and he and I set up this company called SP New Media in ninety end of ninety six, um, and and it played out well. We got. Um, we got access to my father-in-law's uh, clients, so we built, you know, um, very early websites for people for like those Sky, Land Rover, Amtico, and a bunch of others, uh, a couple of big travel companies. Um, and I think by the end of, by the middle of 2000, we had 20 people and we were turning over about a million quid, which wasn't bad for, you know, we were making money. How many did you earn at that point? 20. Okay. Um, and at the, and obviously at that time tech salaries were much lower and it, and it was a profitable business and it was it was doing well and we got approached by a, a publicly listed software company because our timing was great because all these big software companies wanted to bring in proper development skills in house so they approached us in April of two thousand um, with a view to acquiring the business um, and. We had a meeting with them like the next day and then the day after that they faxed faxed, faxed the term sheet over and basically they bought the business a month later um, and we completed it the middle of June. And they bought it on the basis that they wanted everyone else's skills but not really mine, um, which was fine with me. I was 30, 29. Um, and we ended up doing a deal. We sold them the company in June 2000. And if anyone knows their internet history, July 2000 is when the internet bubble went boom. Um, and valuations crashed through the floor. So our timing was impeccable. They bought the business. I was on a four-year earn out. So 
anyone who goes through any kind of exit to a to a to a strategic or a trade buyer um, where they're going to own the company ultimately generally there's some kind of earnout and restrictions and stuff so I had a four year earnout where they paid us some money up front and then they paid the rest over the next four years based on the performance of the business unit that we'd sold them and I had a four year restriction on starting another business in the tech space which at the time I just threw naivety, you know, we were young, um, we had no exposure historically to going through any kind of exit, going through any kind of institutional, f you know, funding. Um, and we were just like, this is, this is, this is an insane situation. We'll, we would sign anything. And, and, you know, we had lawyers and there was a bit, but we still, um, we, we signed up some pretty onerous terms, but it, it, you know what? Um, no regrets. It all worked out in the end. So we sold the company. I, I moved back to Jersey yeah. um, for f 2003, just a year before my earnout was due to finish. Earnout finished in 2004, and suddenly I was free to start something else. And um, you were ready. And I was very ready. I was doing some other stuff. I was consulting. I was doing some um, appearances on Sky TV as like an internet expert on a on a weekly panel show. Um, I did a couple of pieces for like Sky News when they would wanted to talk about you know, e-commerce specifically mostly. Um, moved back to Jersey. Um, I, I did a few kind of projects for friends that were doing e-commerce stuff, but 2000 and f beginning at end of 2004, the earnout was at an end and I was able to start something new. And my intention was to start a web design company in Jersey because at the time there was a couple, they were okay, but there was a huge amount of demand. And two of my good friends had a business called play.com. Um, and I think in 2000, beginning of 2005, they were turning over north of 500 million, biggest employer in Jersey. They had like a thousand employees between Jersey, Heathrow and Cambridge, absolutely smashing it. And I was thinking if I start a web design agency, I can scale it so quickly. And so, f I, but I can only take it so far, you know, it'll pay the rent, it'll pay the mortgage, put the kids through school, but we're never going to create something that could be like a global really smash Really scalable, hit. yeah. Um, and I was looking at play thinking, um, you know, these guys have done this out of Jersey. Yeah. And they're not, they're great guys, they're smart, but, you know, they're not geniuses. This is not rocket science, um, but they've just tapped into a vertical market with a, with a real kind of product market fit um, and there are other vertical markets that are at the, at the middle of t the sort of 2000s that were untapped. And um, and again, I having been kind of in the corporate life and then spent the next four years working for, my, the next eight years really working for myself, stepping back to work for someone else was n probably not gonna happen because the freedom that being an entrepreneur and working for yourself gives you is difficult to walk away from. So I knew I had to start something for myself again um, and we made some money in the first sale, but not retirement money, enough to <laughs> about for seven or eight years. Um, and and then I got divorced as well, which obviously anything that I made, you know, most of it went. Um, and so I was thinking, well, I'm gonna start a new web design company. And then I was looking at what Play, what Play, what Play were doing and thought, no, do you know what, actually, we're better off going client side than agency side. Because if we can find the right vertical, we could create something that is truly global and, you know, hit upon beauty and brought in the right expertise, put £70,000 of our own money into it. Um, 14 years later, sold it to LVMH, 15 years later. And what... Um what spark? What was the spark that um, start, you started thinking about beauty as the vertical? So me, so I'd spoken to the guy that ended up being the co-founder of Feel Unique, um, Richard, and said, "Look, I'm going to start my own agency." And he said, "Well, he was he was in finance, very um, analytical, all the skills that I don't have." Mm -hmm. um, and he said, "Bored doing what he's doing. If you start if you start this, maybe I could." partner with you and I was like yeah great you know so we agreed that we would set set something up together and then obviously we thought you know what let's do something client side yeah. um, we looked at in the middle of 2000s we we looked very closely at doing digital music downloads um, did a lot of research Richard came from the music industry originally um, we looked at digital cameras which we 
were very close to launching. In fact, we had supply. We'd started to build the website. Digital cameras in like 2005 was a thing. I remember. I mean, yeah. right now, who would? <laughs> um, and we were really close to launching that. And then I was in Dublin. Um, I'd gone to a friend's 40th birthday party uh, on a Thursday. I had to be, in a, had to be in, a, in a meeting in Dublin at like 10 o'clock the next morning. So I had to get a flight like... Maybe it was a bit later. I, had to, I remember I had to be on the red eye. So I had to get up at five, basically, to get the seven o'clock to Southampton, transfer from Southampton, get to Dublin. I think whenever I got there, but, but I had to be in Dublin. For, and then I was flying back the same night. I'd gone to my friend's 40th birthday party the night before at the courthouse. And at 11, everyone's going, right. And I'm like, I better go. I've got to go to bed. I'm on the red eye. And everyone's like, no, come on, come back to our house. I went back to their place. And suddenly it's one o'clock. Like, I've got to go. I've got to go. And then suddenly it's like three o'clock. It's like, well, there's no point going now <laughs> so I ended up going straight from this party ran home changed quickly got myself to Dublin did this meeting um, went back to the airport within like a couple of hours and I find myself in Dublin airport absolutely knackered and um, wandering around you the got airport. through the meeting though got through, yeah, the meeting was fine that was a doddle but I'm back at the airport I'm hanging and um, I was wandering around the duty free area sorry wandering around the duty-free area and I walk past the clinique counter and the girl looks at me and says, oh, would you like to try some moisturizer? And I'm like, no, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. And um, she could clearly see that I was like, not really that fine. I was like really hanging by. I haven't slept for 24 hours. I haven't shaved, probably stank of booze. Anyway, she, she was quite chatty. I bought this moisturizer from her. Um, Actually, she gave me a sample. I put it on. And I was like, "Oh God!" Actually, do you know what? That's actually quite nice. Like, because I was like hanging on this cold moisturizer goes on my face, um, and I bought twenty five whatever it quid it was for Clinique M lotion. I still remember it. Um, sitting on the plane on the way back, you know, just I've got this moisturizer in my pocket. And I'm like, and historically, I'd been one of those guys that my bathroom single guy was like head and shoulders and a bar of soap that's it and Gillette whatever um no no cleansers no moisturizers none of that stuff and um I'm sitting on the plane going actually oh there's something in this moisturizer thing I'm gonna have to get some more when this runs out I like it it's you know I could see the attraction all of a sudden and I was thinking actually if I could buy that online because you knew what you wanted I know what I want yeah and it's just a replenishment thing and I was like where would I go and I was like oh my gosh we should sell men's beauty products on the internet. And I'd had loads of ideas. So I got off the plane as, a, as I'm walking across the apron, I phone Richard up. I said, I think I've got it. I think I've got what we need to do. And he's like, what? I, like, yeah, what now? Um, and I said, beauty, we should, do be we should do men's beauty products. And I explained why. And he went, mm, there's something in this. And then he phoned me back a couple of hours later and went, yeah, I think, I think you're right. I think we should do that. And that was it. That was what we did. Um, and Feely Unique was born from that moment. We realized as we was, before we'd even put pen to paper on any sort of financial model that selling men's beauty products on its own wasn't enough, but actually there was a real gap with, with beauty products in general. There was very little competition. What there was wasn't doing it very well. They were, they were very focused on specific parts of the market, like prestige or fragrances or hair or mass. Our research said that really most people buy across across everything. Yeah. You might buy a Chanel lipstick and you might buy a CeraVe moisturizer and you might buy a God knows what fragrance. Um, so our, our thinking was we need to we need to create a kind of a source of beauty where you can buy everything that you need in one place. And that's what we did. So um, some of you here might have seen the photo of the first Feel Unique office, shall we call it, with the... Was it above yeah, Pizza was it. Express? Yeah, above, that was opposite Pizza opposite Express, Pizza above Express. the little jewellers in town. So how long was there between the infamous night out and the meeting in Dublin and that picture? Like, how long did it yeah, take so you to get to Pete's that point? Yeah, so that was birthday. That was April. Okay. Um, we launched the website in October. Oh, sorry, no. Pete's birthday was in February. We formed the company and got the office in, in April. Um, and then we launched the website in October of 2005. Yeah, so quite quick. Yeah. Yeah, and we we spent the first six weeks like hardcore research, product market fit, speaking to you know because we weren't obviously from the beauty industry, speaking to potential you know what the 
and we were lucky because almost everyone is a consumer of what we sell. So it was easy for us to reach out, reach our consumers, find out what they wanted, what would they, wouldn't they buy online, would they be prepared, would they want to see price difference, what sort of promotions. And also because we come, or I'd come from a background of having worked with consumer brands selling products on the internet, we kind of knew how to get people through the door, how to attract them, how to convert them, how to retain them, yeah. how to get them to come back. We, and not we, many we, people had that, that experience, I'm guessing, at the time. Not at that point. Most of, no. most of our competitors were like, you know, a chain of hair salons that says, oh, we should just sell our products online. Yeah. Um, or, you know. Or like uh, brick and mortar. Or bricks trend. and mortar that have moved to, to yeah. .com, yeah. yeah. Um, so I know you mentioned just before the 70K. So how did that play out? You just did some kind of estimations and thought this is what we need to get it off the ground. So Richard still has a spreadsheet. I remember going to his house like a few days after we had the idea. Yeah. He knocked up the spreadsheet, which we ended up using as a sort of, basic management account spreadsheet it did get more and more complex as days went as the, as the years went by but we used it as base kind of cash flow and management accounts in in the first place and and kind of sat there and and spent you know several hours on what do we need to build this thing to get it up and running how much can we afford to buy in stock what's reasonable kind of expectations of returns um you know, uh, Mark, we, 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 you know, we, it was, we were lucky in that we weren't wildly wrong with our predictions, but it's still, you know, any of you know that at this point in time, when you're putting financial projections together, they're almost certainly going to be wrong. It's a question of by how much. Um, and the thought that's gone behind it. Yeah, but we did, I mean, we, we did everything in our power with the knowledge that we had, with the basic understanding of the principles of, of the business. And at that time, the funding ecosystem was very different. We never came from this from a position of, let's raise some money and make this happen. We just didn't even consider that as an option. Yeah. It wasn't even on our radar. We never came from it, at it from a perspective of, Let's put this money in to get an MVP in the, hopefully in a year's time, we can then go out and raise a seed round or a series A of X, Y, or Z. We came at it from a position of, right, this is what it's going to cost us to get to break even. And it was, it was about 70 grand. And that's it. Yeah. From that point forward, we need to be making money. Mm -hmm. um, because at that point in time in 2005, unless you're really like in the hardcore tech space in Palo Alto or wherever, that's how companies started. Mm. It's like, this thing needs to make money or what's the what point? Is, yeah. um, so you had that focus that you had so we, to. Yeah, but our business plan was built on the premise of, it's a company and it needs to make money. Otherwise, we're just gonna go bankrupt. Yeah. Um, so we did, a, we did a cash flow forecast and we predicted that we were gonna, we should break even. Our burn rate was about five grand a month. We should break even in about month 18. I think we broke even in month 17 and we never raised a penny. Um, we did a couple of little deals along the way where we needed access to bricks and mortar. We needed a spa. Yeah, so because did, of the brands and their... Yeah, to get certain brands that we wanted, we had to have physical presence. And we ended up doing a deal with Lawrence Hugler at the club hotel. And he ended up taking a small amount of equity, putting a little bit of money in, in return for us being able to rebrand his spa and call that our bricks and mortar presence. Oh, okay, that was and then we did a deal with it. Carl Moss, who had a business called My Memory. Um, so when we were still packing boxes ourselves above the jewelers in Halkett Place, Carl had a decent sized warehouse and he was getting he was getting kind of bulk rates from Jersey Post. Whereas at that point we were we were packing post bags and hauling them like Santa to Broad <laughs> Street every day. Okay. Um, and Carl said, look, if you guys want to move into our warehouse, we had a load of, sp had a load of space. Um, maybe we can do some kind of deal where we give you access to all of our bulk postage rates. You can share the office. Um, and we ended up doing that. We gave him a small slug of equity and he joined the board. Oh, cool. Okay. Um, but we never actually raised money. And then I think within about six months of being in there, we'd outgrown my memory. So we ended up having to take a bigger warehouse the other side of the um, Rue de Prey Park and then from there we moved within about another year to 20,000 square feet at St Peter's Technical Park and then I think 2012 we had 250 people 
and then 2014 we we moved out of Jersey and moved moved the uh, logistics up to Northampton. At what point in the kind of research and the idea development and kind of scaling the business did you start thinking about potential exit opportunities? Day one, before we even started it. Okay, yeah. <laughs> I thought you might say that. And I, 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 I don't think that every business should start from that perspective because because uh, my kids, one of my kids is quite interested in starting a business and she's, because she's seen this evolution and there is very much a culture around creating a business with a, with a, with a vision to an exit. I'd still constantly reinforce to her that there's nothing wrong with starting a company and building it to and running it for the rest of your life and leaving it as a legacy to your family. That's a thing, you know, that's that's not a that's not a that's not an ambition that shouldn't be respected as well. But for us it was very much about the exit because we knew that there was this kind of window of opportunity for what we were doing and the way that the beauty industry was kind of evolving. At the time when we started it, we couldn't get any brands because they didn't want, most of them were real heritage kind of old school brands like the Estee Lauder companies and the L'Oreal group, they've been around for hundreds of years and um, a, real, a real aversion to being sold online. Um, and we knew that that was gonna catch up and we had this chance to sort of own that vertical but we knew that if we didn't own it, Netaporta or ASOS or Sephora um, and others. So we, so for us, we always knew that we should, we need to get it to a that certain point. That kept the point. sense of urgency. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I know you've like um, touched on it already today. How big a thing do you think is luck when it comes to um, being successful as an entrepreneur? I, I feel like I should say not at all because that. <laughs> would be like <laughs> it's I think it timing I think I think I think I, I, do you know what I'd rather back someone who was lucky than someone who was smart okay um, but I do think that luck is not completely random yeah I think if you've got someone who's genuinely done the work in the background and they're setting themselves up for success through having the right people on board, having the right plan, having a good product market fit, um, you know, having the resilience to see it through. Yeah. Um, because investing in any business, the best idea with a founder who don't have faith in execution mm -hmm. is probably worse than an average idea with a founder who is very likely to succeed. So I think, I think as long as, as long as you're doing the work in the background and, you know, luck, luck, play, luck will then play it. You kind of make your own luck. It's more likely, yeah, if um, you're doing and all the it, right and things. And the same with, yeah, uh, yeah. Um, so kind of linked to that, what do you think are like the key characteristics of successful entrepreneurs? Like from people you know and people you've met, are there any like certain personality traits or the way they do things that you kind of recognize i think the one thing that's underestimated a lot and i think I've, and i've been quite lucky because we went through that feeling it was you know a, quite a high profile business in the uk so we we got access and we got access you know access to a lot of you know investment professionals and you know like founder networks at that kind of high levels um we were like the minnows but things like founders forum where you know you have like probably now about 500 tech founders from around the world gather every year and you know businesses like all the big players are there um and we've been lucky enough to kind of meet some great founders along the way um and even you know businesses that are massively successful but not on that kind of scale um and it's something which we always tried to really focus on at feel unique and i think so often people We'll ignore it. We'll ignore it. But I think it's a core skill, and it sounds really trite and really cheesy. But it's being nice, and I think, yeah, obviously you have to be smart enough to be able to do all the expected business stuff. But to be really successful, at you are going to need friends in all sorts of places along the way, commercially, like with suppliers, with with customers. Um, when you're out there touting for business, when you're out there negotiating deals with suppliers, when you're out there negotiating with venture funds, 
it's so important that whatever you come out with commercially from those engagements, those, those interactions and those meetings, you need to come out with them liking you. Because if you're not, if that venture guy's about to like deploy a couple of million quid and he's only got, there's only so much of their fund left, they know they've got to work with you for the next five or six years. They don't want to work with assholes. Nobody wants to work with assholes. So I think arrogance um, is really, really dangerous. And it's not something you tend to see with like really good entrepreneurs who have executed and have built a company with a fantastic culture. And the reason that Feel Unique was successful at a commercial level was because we employed people who went out of their way to create great relationships with our suppliers. So Feel Unique was the only retailer, even to this day, now that we're part, now that the business has gone to Sephora, that had the brands like Chanel and Dior and you know the really prestige brands. And the reason that we had them is because we were nice to do business with. We were we were the sort of people that you want to hang out with outside of work. And we have that rule now. We know with you know, especially within an Indu, and you know, obviously we're going through a whole kind of funding thing in a, 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 of our own at the moment, but you know, we, we, we went through a whole bunch of venture capital firms and there's probably a, only a handful where we thought, would we want to hang out with these people outside of work? Because we're gonna have to work with them for a long time. So for us, it's really important that um, you're easy to get along with because, and again, even from a, from a supplier perspective, if you're working with suppliers and your competitors are working with the same suppliers, if that supplier has an opportunity a promotional opportunity. So in our instance, you know, a brand benefit might say, you know, we've got uh, 500,000 mascaras to give away. We want to partner with one of the retailers. Mm -hmm. Who are they going to pick up the phone to? They're going to pick up the phone to the one that that person likes. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? The one that that person has a good relationship with. And I think all of the other stuff, yeah, obviously the resilience and financial acumen and, you know, all those things that different types of businesses and different entrepreneurs will demonstrate a whole range of skills. I think the one thing that sits across most of them is um, they'll generally be pretty easy to get on with and you'll want to be hanging out with them. That and it's not because they're successful. It's because they're like people that are engaging and interesting and, it is the and relationship. open and friendly and I think that's really, really badly underestimated. I say it to my team all the time. Don't come out of a meeting feeling like you have to win a point because mm. trust me, down the line, it's not going to be helpful. It comes around, doesn't it? So I want to get on to Indu, but um, just a couple more questions about around um, Feel Unique. What was like your biggest lesson in that journey? Private equity, stay away from it. <laughs> Easy. <laughs> Quick one. We sold half the company to private equity in 2012, end of 2012. Um, we were growing really, really well. We were worried that we weren't going to win the prize before somebody else did. We, we had a lot of strategic interest in buying the company. Um, we were speaking to at that point to, look to LVMH and um, L'Oreal and Hearst magazines and a whole bunch of them. Um, and we ended up doing a deal with private equity on the basis that they should help us to achieve more optionality down the line and partner with us. Uh, and what we found was that, you know, there's a, there's a lot of horror stories around private equity. There's a lot of great stories, um, but there's also a lot of horror stories, you know, and we, we were on the sh end of that in that, you know, they brought in a team of people who didn't really understand our business. Um, they made a lot of terrible mistakes for the next five years. We lost, we went from being 45 million turnover, about two and a half million of EBITDA of profit, uh, in 2012-13 to losing about three to five million for the next five years under them. Okay. Um, huge amount of expenditure, um, business was kind of mismanaged really, um, took a lot of chances, um, eventually kind of got their act together and pulled it around when we were able to finally sell it. But I think going into, going into a partnership with private equity, you really need to kind of um, go in with your eyes open. And we were quite naive when we did the deal. So, um, is someone here from private equity? No. <laughs> no. Um, so I was going to ask this anyway, but you've kind of touched on it there with entrepreneurship. There's obviously times of a lot of stress and pressure. How do you personally, um, manage that? Is there like certain hobbies that you do? Or yeah. What? So in the early days of feeling unique, um, uh, badly, really badly. Okay. Um, I, I mean, I'm like, I'm not slim at the moment, but I was like four stone heavier when we were about 12 months into Feel Unique. I um, just like working 12 hours days, six days a week, really unhealthy and also pointless. Um, much better to employ people um, around you. Um, really stressed, 
Um, the first, and then we had twins, which didn't really help. Um, and then, so the, the first sort of seven or eight years of feeling, I was super unhealthy. And, and it plays out in all sorts of ways. Um, this time, once we, once we sold half the business to private equity, I'd stepped back to about sort of third time. Okay. And then I ended up going back um, just before COVID hit full time. But by then I really had a bit of a wake up call in terms of like health and work life balance. And so now I, um, now with Indy, we've got a great team of people. Um, I, I hate it when somebody, especially in, in within our team will go, well, you know, I, I'm, you know, I work 12 hour days, I work six, six days a week, I'm always on, I never turn my email off, like it's a badge of honor, it really isn't. Um, in fact, it's, I think it has the opposite effect that you're trying to achieve, especially for the company, because we want people who are focused and, you know, on it all the time. So what do I do? Um, I, I have like slots in my diary, like where I'm like, if I want to go for a bike run on a Thursday, I'm like, it's in my diary. Mm. It's like two you hours. The I, and then I can't put anything in it. Um, I don't tend to work at the weekends. I tend, I have, I have like, um, my phone has a whole, all the kind of do not disturb stuff on it from like eight in the evening till eight the next morning. Um, I try and, I've got a dog, so I walk the dog most days when I'm in, when I'm in Jersey. If I'm in London, I'm in London probably like two or three days a week. At the end of every day, I'll go and walk for like an hour, even if it's around Hyde Park or just around Marlborough where we tend to be. Um, I, I, now it starts to get a bit kind of like my kids think I'm some sort of like tech bro biohacker, but ice baths uh, probably like four times a week. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, three degrees, yeah. three minutes. Um, that's probably more of a mental health thing because you genuinely feel amazing after. It's very difficult to come out of an ice bath in a bad mood. For like an ice bath years. rather than the sea. Seas, the sea's about 10 degrees at the moment. It's not no, really it's not, cold. It's not cold enough. Okay. <laughs> no. I started off doing the sea. Yeah, okay. And then the sea warmed up. Um, and then we got a pool. I was, we we're lucky that we had the pool and didn't put the heating on it. And so in February and March, that would be about five degrees. But then as it warmed up, like two years ago when I got into this, it was too, it was too warm. So then we bought like a plunge ice bath bucket thing that you had to f oh, fill okay. with water. And I was spending... 10 quid a day at Roberts, buying four big bags of ice. And then, and I was probably doing that like four or five times a week. So I was doing like 160, 180 quid a month on ice. And then my wife's getting annoyed. So I bought an actual ice bath, um, okay. which which keeps the water at three degrees and filters it and cleans it. Is it the morning then that you could Yeah, so I have an ice bath in the morning. And then in the evening, if we've got a sauna. <laughs> oh, very good. Okay, I see the biohacking coming yeah. in. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And the sauna just leaves you feeling so calm, like at the end of it, you can't, you just feel genuine, genuinely relaxed. And it sounds really kind of like tech bro, kind of biohacky. However, um, I was really stressed before I started getting into it. And I just have this, there are certain things that I, if I don't do them, I get wound up, I get anxious, I get stressy, I get irritable. And um, it's a habit now, so you yeah, just it's do a habit. it. And you, yeah, and you know, there are, there's a lot of science now as well behind the benefits. And I do go in the sea as well, in, in, in um in the winter you know i won't use the ice bath when it's see super cold and then i surf as much as i can um which at the moment's not been a lot but usually uh, three or four times a week if i can thanks Sam. that's um really interesting to know because obviously everyone's manages it a bit differently <laughs> um get some ice <laughs> so yeah so okay so if we think of about the exit to sephora yeah 132 million 132 is that right 132 million so we didn't get that obviously because we had private equity. Yeah, private equity, and by that point, um, was that the the highlight at the time, the career highlight? Yeah, of course. Um, you know, we, we had like five difficult years under private equity. Um, if if we'd done things differently and things had gone our way, yeah, yeah the shareholders of Feely Neat would have walked away with 132 million quid because we could have done that deal ourselves without private equity. In fact, we we would have sold it for more. Um, I have no doubt about that. But I do genuinely do think you either, there's no right or wrong paths when you're making these decisions. There's a left and a right. We took the right path. If we'd taken the left path, I might have got run over by a bus. 
something could have happened commercially. It is what it is. And we yeah. don't get me wrong, everybody did okay out of it. Yeah. Um, and it's, um, yeah, uh, it, but there were, there were certain shareholders because when you get private equity involved, things go from a very clean cap table of everybody's on the same share types to there are different structures of shares. There's preference shares and then there was super preference. There was all this kind of like different tiers. There's a whole stack of, of, of and, and the, the ordinary shares. Um, the pool at the top is was obviously diminished because of all the dilutions that happened along the way. Um, so some of the ordinary shareholders that were in at the very beginning didn't do as well as they probably should have. Um, um, but don't get me wrong, it was an amazing exit and most people did really, really well out of it. However, there were a few people that were just really <laughs> off about it. And just, you know, I just say to them, we started a business with a 70,000 pounds investment seven, 16 years ago. 16 years later, we sold it to LVMH for 132 million. That's all you need to think about. That's the narrative that's gonna get you funding for your next venture. That's, you know, that's, that's an amazing story. Very, very few people start a business and then exit it with the whole pool of cash. Um, because often there are dilutions and there are changes and there are, you know, restructuring and all sorts of things that happen along the way. Um, so yeah, yeah, that was definitely a career highlight, yeah. What did you do to celebrate? Um, I don't think we really did much on that one. <laughs> Probably just tired. <laughs> it was just, you know what? The thing was, we sold, we sold half the business in 2012, end of 2012. Um, and that was a clean 56% of the business that we sold at a valuation of like 27 million. Um, we celebrated then. Okay. Uh, me and, uh, we went to Dubai for a week and then we went to the Maldives for two weeks with the kids. Um, and that was that was a that was a that was that was a major celebration. The problem that we had when we did the exit to LVMH was that we sold it in twenty. We sold it just as we were coming out of COVID, yeah. uh, mid twenty one. Um, I wasn't sure if I was going to stay or go at that point. I was. So I ended up staying with Sephora for a year. But although we sold it in twenty one, we'd actually started the sale process in twenty eighteen. So in twenty eighteen, we were on the market. We had better offers in 2018 that we ended up selling it for. We had we had an, we had offers of north of 200 million in 2018, um, but the private equity guys felt that wasn't enough, um, so we ended up pulling out of the process. We went we did another process in 20 beginning of 2020, just as COVID hit, um, and again we that that process failed. So then we did another process in 2021, and finally, and it was a even that process was a difficult, it was a difficult thing to get through. It was, it, it's like, it's all, both of the actual events, like selling half to private equity in 2012 and the final exit to Sephora in 2021 were the worst years of the business and the best because selling a business of that scale is an intense amount of work. The due diligence was like six months. They spent, you know, when, when the PE guys came on board, they spent a million pounds on due diligence for a business that, that they bought at a valuation of 26 million. You know, it was like half a million pounds in legal fees. It was, you know, PwC earned like a quarter of a million. It was, and they're earning that money by getting under your bonnet and sucking your time and distracting you from the business. And, and the deal's on and then it's off and then, then they're chipping the price. And you're, you know, it, it was a horrible experience until the moment where it's like, it's signed and it's like, phew, it's Just over. Just go surfing. Yeah, and that, that was kind of like elevated even further in, in the final exit to LVMH. It was like, a, it was just like constant, like massive highs and massive lows. Like it's done, it's not, it's over. The deal was over probably four times. Okay. Like gone, <laughs> history, forget it, walk away and then suddenly it's back on. Okay, I'm getting a, a better understanding of the reality now. Um, so let's move on That's to- That's our experience. <laughs> let's move on to Indy. Yep. So I'm gonna ask the same question or similar question. 
where did that idea come what was the moment that that where the, there was like the light bulb moment where you started yeah so that one's easy so we sold the business we knew was, we knew we'd sold the business to Sephora the deal was done yeah in June of 2021 um but I mean it was it was done but we couldn't announce it until September because there were some um anti-competition requirements because Sephora is global and massive um bizarrely in Saudi Arabia so there was some legal stuff that had to go backwards and forwards to lawyers in Saudi Arabia about um kind of monopolies and mergers and a whole bunch of stuff that I didn't really get involved in um so we couldn't announce it so in in August of 21 I so I have twin daughters yeah. who are now 14 in August of 21 they were they were 12 years old and um, I agreed that I was going to stay on at Sephora for another year um, to basically to hand over the business because Feel Unique became Sephora UK. That's why Sephora bought the company because they wanted a foothold in the UK. And um, I knew that I was going to stay on and I was chatting to my kids in a water park in Mallorca at lunch, chicken nuggets, chips. I could, it's one of those things you just remember those kind of pivotal moments really, really clearly. And um, I was interested in the clothes that they wear because as a retailer, we, we all want to attract teenagers for the, in the beauty space because you want to get them young. You want to get them onto your loyalty programs. You want to keep them and retain them. And you know, so you want to get them baked into your brand early. And I'm talking to my kids about fashion because there are even me as like a really uncool dad there, I could name you five or six teenage fashion brands off the top of my head that sit very firmly in that space. They're cool enough that teenagers are all over them and they want them. But as a parent, there's like a degree of validation because I'm cool with it. The price is good. So I'm cool with it. And to them, it's cool. And most importantly, those brands exist on a community. Do you know what I mean? they my kids are learning about Brandy Melville and Subdued and these teen brands through the community that they exist in in social media, which is primarily around TikTok. Because they wear uniforms to school. They're not reading magazines. They're not looking at television adverts. So the way that those fashion brands build a relationship with their consumers is by building communities. So I was curious as to, as a retailer, what do we need to do to get teenagers? Um, and so then I asked them the question, what beauty brands are you guys buying what teenage beauty brands are you guys buying and the answer was well there aren't really any and I, was, I was like challenge that a bit you know there's, and I name a couple like Florence by Mills which is Millie Bobby Brown's brand bit older bubble skincare again bit older just skincare some of the other ones are a bit twee and pink and unicorny and cheap or not great ingredients so then I'm like well what are you buying and Frankie pulls out a Too Faced Better Than Sex mascara she's 12 years old and I'm like oh, it's not ideal as a dad going to school you pull that out in school yeah all the girls have got it I was like well it's, mm, it's a great brand it's a great product but it's not ideal for a 12 year old and then India goes oh I've got this NARS orgasm blush and now I'm like distraught so and I'm like girls the thing is right these brands are aimed at like 25 35 year old women women um generally they are they're portraying an ideal of what beauty is based on a much older woman. And you know what? You're 12. They shouldn't be aspiring to the supermodel ideal of what beauty is. That's my like dad hat. Yeah. And then I'm like, so what skincare products are you buying? And then they've got, they're pulling out products like you know, the drunk elephant all over the news at the moment. Drunk elephant uh, all over TikTok. Teenagers buying this product with retinols in. And kids do not need retinols in their skin. It's like harmful at that age. And they're buying all these products because they see it on TikTok, which are really inappropriate for them and not actually almost un unhealthy and damaging potentially. So then as a joke, we sort of said, you know, like we should, start, well, I think one of them said, well, we, we should do that. We should start our own brand. And I was thinking, yeah, you know, we would <laughs> eat chicken nuggets, joking about it. What would we call it? India's nickname is Indu. So I would call it Indu. And she, and she went, if you call it that, I'll leave home. <laughs> um, and anyway, it was like a stupid idea and we've got all about it. But often as an entrepreneur, you have an idea. And over time, I've had like hundreds of great ideas. Over time, whether it's hours, days, weeks or months, the idea will tr generally track down. 
cost of entry is too big, too much competition, cost of goods are higher than we thought. And it gets to the point you've just forgotten and I've forgotten almost all the ideas I ever had now. Sometimes you have an idea and the more you think about it, it tracks up to the point where you have to execute it. And that for me has probably happened like three times now. So I went back to the hotel, kids went off and I was sitting there thinking actually there is something in this and spoke to a load of sort of real experts that we know in the beauty industry um, because obviously we've been lucky to, to meet lots of like really high profile people in the industry. Got this idea, start a teenage beauty brand, like, you know, kind of like the Hollister equivalent of beauty. What do you think? Lots of people said, yeah, I love it. If you do it, will it we, can we invest? Um, and anyway, so two years ago, two and a half years ago, we had the idea and we launched it in September. Um, we raised about 3.8 million that went into it. Mm -hmm. um, we launched and now we're just at the moment negotiating to go into one of the big three. Well, actually, we've had offers to go into Superdrug Boots and Sephora. But they all want exclusivity, so we're hopefully going to make a decision on that this week. And we're just about to, well, we're now in the middle of raising four million to take it into retail. So just remind me when the um, chicken nuggets conversation was? August of 21. Okay, yeah, so it's... <laughs> Two and a half years. And we, launched, and we launched it in a big way. We could have done the whole kind of like kitchen formulation thing and made some products in the kitchen and put them in little pots and sold them on the internet. But we're like, we want to create a global brand. A global brand. So we went all in hired 10 people, raised a load of money, proper formulated products. We used the same team that formulate most of Elemis's products, um, high quality ingredients, you know, tailored specifically for teenage skin. We worked with 2000 kids for three months on initial product research, market research. From that, we built a committee of 30 teenagers that were involved in like every single decision that we made, okay. colors, textures, they got all the products to test. Um, that committee is, started at 30 and is now 300 you know tone of voice every everything that goes on the website will be run through the committee like we have this platform called mighty that we use so the kids will get polled should we use this word or that word should we use this image or that image you prefer this smell that smell um so the brand's genuinely got that kind of um auth authenticity which was like key from day one and it's great experience for them as well yeah, that, and they love it. They get yeah. free products. They get, you know, and, and also they act as like the basis of the community and the, yeah. you know, the, the sort of core of the, the core marketing channels that kind of nano that there's 300 on the committee and there's about, and at the moment there's about another 500 on the sort of brand fan group that sits behind that, which is kind of like the basis of the community. Yeah. Um, does it get any easier now that you're a second time founder? Bird. Third, sorry. <laughs> um, no. It, it, what gets easier is, and if I was an investor, well, I am an investor, but I, uh, what gets easier is raising money. Mm, okay. Because there is an element of trust in that you've done it before. So that's kind of a tick in the box. Yeah. For me, it's not because I know what we're really like behind the curtain. Do you know what I mean? So I wouldn't invest in me any more than I'd invest in any of you. Um, and that's not being like critical of you guys. It's like, I think it comes down to, you know, obviously it comes down a lot about the business and do I like the people and those sorts of things. But what we did was no more special than what anyone's doing. We would, we just planned it well and we were very, very lucky on timing. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I think, yeah, I think the only thing that gets easier is Raising money is easier. And and what it does though, it, it it's not that, that people throw money at you because you've exited a business before, it's that it opens the door. Do you know what I mean? We can generally get an audience with anyone. Yeah. Um, and often that's the hardest thing. And often it's the hardest thing because I think there's a fear of doing it rather than- That it's actually- That it's actually that hard. Because if you've got a great idea and you approach somebody in the right way, and you're not an asshole, they're probably gonna to listen to you if they are an investor, because investors' jobs is to find businesses to invest in. And I think often we, we kind of fear that. We're like, oh, you know, I can't approach that fund or that person or that high net worth or that angel because, mm. you know, I'm me. And it's like, but they want businesses to invest in. It's like yeah. journalists, journalists want stories. You know? Yeah, and do you think, um kind of going into talking about Jersey and Jersey as a place to um, start a startup, obviously with the bootcamp being a good example of that. 
do you find Jersey's quite a good place in terms of people quite accessible? They're willing to meet you for a coffee, get feedback. I thought feedback. that question was going to go another way then. Um, yeah, I think Jersey is, in terms of like finding access to, to investors, yeah. I think I think Jersey's a great place to be. Yeah. Um, because there's a lot of high net worths around who actually do want to deploy money locally. Mm -hmm. um, they can afford to do it because generally they're saving so much in tax by being here. Yeah. Uh, it looks good for them to do so. And I think a lot of the ones, certainly the ones that we meet, they want, they genuinely want to do something at a community level. And backing early stage and startup businesses in Jersey is a good way for them to do that because a lot of them do come from a business background. They will have an interest in it. And a lot of it comes down to having access to them or feeling confident enough to, to approach them and say, look, I've got this great idea, you're interested. Um, I think that part of being in Jersey is great. I think this sort of thing is great. And there was nothing like this when we started Feel Unique. So we were kind of on our own. Um, I wish there had been because there were a lot of things that we did that may have been very different if we if we if we'd had more experience or access to um you know founders and other people who had done it before and heard other you know heard other stories but we just we were kind of flying blind at that point okay so just another question on jersey what do you think is jersey's big opportunity like in the entrepreneur space but kind of more broadly in the tech space so this this i, I mean i worry sometimes that it's like the car it's like the cart leading the horse i think i think what as an island we need to do is we need to make it we need to make it an easy place for people to be free thinkers and for people to create ideas i think once we start saying there's a great opportunity in reg tech in jersey or in data or in yeah. this we're like trying to most great entrepreneurs will have ideas based on their experience and things that they've seen and gone I could do this better or this is a thing that doesn't exist it's I think once we start to try and shoehorn in Jersey's got great fiber or we've got a great finance industry so we should be pushing these things I, th I think that's kind of risky I think the best idea who would have predicted play.com yeah. like two guys were selling originally jumpers and then trainers mm -hmm had an idea to like buy a couple of DVDs off the back of a magazine and, and sorry, and sell DVDs on the back of a magazine. That, that's how they started. We could never have facilitated that. The only thing that we can facilitate is making the tax environment good for them. The ability to open a bank account, the ability to open, a, open you know, start a company, um, the ability to employ people, the ability yeah. to have access to talent. That's what we need to be focusing on is, is providing the infrastructure to allow the people with the creative minds to have ideas of their own. Yeah, I see that, that foundation. Yeah. And then let people come up with um, the ideas. Having said that, you know, we have got a great finance industry and there's probably some great entrepreneurs with that in the back of their mind. Exactly. And I'm sure that they will find those opportunities. But yeah, I think I shouldn't just be around that. Yeah. Exactly. And I think some of the best businesses that have come out of Jersey like a full of people who did not want to go anywhere near the random, finance industry. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I guess to wrap up, what would you say to these guys? Um, many of them are at idea stage or kind of early stage. Given it's 2024, the environment, how it is, what would you say would be like your kind of piece of advice? I think for us, um, you know, we, we did have some businesses along the way that are complete dogs that failed. Um, I think, it, and, and some of them we kind of knew or, or we felt there was a high chance of failure. The ones that did well, we kind of knew. There was, there was very little doubt because we'd really, done, we'd really done our product market fit research. We'd really spoken to the audience. Mm -hmm. You know, we really... And I don't know whether they did well because we believed so strongly in them. Um, so yeah, my, uh, it's that having that confidence and that yeah, conviction. My, yeah, yeah, try, I, I, I fail. You know, if something, if if you think this is not going to work, pull the parachute. Don't drag it on because we've dragged on Move some on. dogs, um, and you know everyone ends up losing money. 
Um, and then the other thing is I really, really, really think it's important that surround yourself with people that you want to hang out with and nice people and, you know, be nice, be kind. That's what got us where we were because we were just nice to do business with and people, you know, wanted to help and give you contracts and get stuff done. That's probably the worst bit of advice anyone said in the last <laughs> few weeks. No, it's really refreshing to hear that kind of thing. And it's so true. It's about uh, totally. people and relationships. Yeah, it is. It's about relationship and that's a better way to put it. Think about think about the impression that you're leaving and every interaction. Well, thank you so much, Aaron, for your time. It's been great to hear like more of the kind of background and what was going on with all three of the businesses. Um, and yeah, it's great to have you. Pleasure. Thank you.